And again, thank you for your faithfulness. On the back table, there's tracks. Please carry tracks. Pass them out. Um, uh, the, he that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed could be comfortably realigned, rephrased. And I'm not changing the Bible. I'm just giving you an example. He that goeth forth with a leaky seed basket. Just talk about him everywhere. And... Um, when we, when we narrowed soul winning down to a very brief time, we miss lots of opportunities to talk to people. And so carry tracks, look for people. Uh, I'm, I don't know, but I'm, I'm willing to guess that I've won as many people accidentally as I have when I was out soul winning. And, and maybe not. I'm not a good statistics person. But um, the, the point is, let's be ready. Always be ready to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that's in you. And so Ephesians chapter 4 in your Bible, uh, we're not going to review tonight for the sake of time, because I don't know how long this is going to take. But um, this, uh, this evening, we, we, we've been for some weeks talking about Satan and um, about him. And I, I've found as many, when I study something, I don't open... Um, Bible dictionaries and commentaries and um, to, to do a series on Satan, I don't go buy a book on Satan because most of the people who write books are dumb as a rock. Uh, I found every verse in the Bible that used the word devil or devils and then Satan and, uh, and then I, I started looking and, and then I found Leviathan and uh, then I found serpent and then dragon and you find all those verses and you just throw them all into a big bowl and, uh, and digitally speaking. And uh, then I just start scrolling through and read them and read them and read them. And then I think, well, these go here and, and these go here and, and these kind of go together. And, um, and what happens is you'll far, start finding out what the Bible says instead of what people say. And it's way safer to know what the Bible says because that God be true and every man a liar. And uh, so uh, I, I do my best to have us have scripture for everything we want. And you'd be surprised how amazing this book is if you could get people out of it. And I would like you to have as much of it as we can. So tonight, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, relationship, things that are going on between you and the devil and um, the uh, things you should do, things you should be aware of and by the time we get to the end, it, it, it'll make sense when we tie this all together. So look at Ephesians chapter 4, and we are going to end in Ephesians 6. So if you want to mark Ephesians, uh, you'll at least have the first and the last verse. But Ephesians 4, look down at verse 27, and we're kind of pulling these verses out of the stories tonight. People say, oh, don't take a verse out of context. We don't have six hours for a Bible study. So uh, anyway, that's just how we do it here. Right? But look at verse 27. Neither give place... To the devil. Now he's got a list of things he's talking about. Verse 26, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Verse 27, neither give place to the devil. Verse 28, let him that stole steal no more. Verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Each one of these verses, um, they are connected, but they, are, they can stand alone as well. But in verse 27, what you see, neither give place to the devil. Now, tonight, we're just going to run through very briefly, just point out, and you'll see in a minute, but almost one word lessons tonight. And this first word is place. You don't want to give what? Place, place to the devil. All right. So um, uh, let's just take Brother, Brother Matuzak back there. He's been at our home on uh, many occasions for holidays and um, because no one else wants him. But <laughs> no, but he usually is going from one home to another. And he says, well, I got time to squeeze the pastor in from this time to this time. But but uh, he's been at our home, and so we'll have the dinner table set, and there'll be a what for him? A place. Now, if out of the clear blue, uh, Matt and Esther show up, <laughs> we don't expect them, but, but if somebody just shows up, we'll just shift chairs around, and we will make a place for them. It wasn't planned, but you, can, you know what I mean. You can make a place for somebody, and... Uh, you know, Tim Smith says, hey, I was going to come by, preacher. Oh, good, come over. And then he brings his wife and four kids and then Juan and his girlfriend and mother-in-law. And pretty soon we're just setting up another table. But, but and that's okay. I like, I like uh, you know, the, um, I don't know where it says it in the Bible. Somewhere it says the pastor should be given to hospitality. 
And that doesn't mean put people in the hospital. It means enjoy being with people, and I do. But uh, so he says in, in Ephesians 4, 27, neither give place to the devil. So that is as simple as if you've got a, if you've got a struggle at all with liquor, you shouldn't go into a liquor store or a bar to buy a Coke. Now, I do my best to not go any place like that because of example and testimony and whatever. But let's don't get too hyper on this because if you go to the grocery store, they have booze. And uh, Circle K, my favorite addiction fulfilling place with the $6 for a whole month of sodas, um, they, sell, they don't sell anything there that's bad except the booze and the cigarettes and the lotto and all that stuff. So, um, so don't, go, don't go freaking out and treating people bad because they bought a, a Coke at a, a place that you wouldn't go to. Um, but I personally try to avoid things that are predominantly that thing. And, um, but, but the point is, if, you, if you're struggling with liquor, you should not go to that, what? That place. You shouldn't give a place. And so there are a lot of things that a parent would do with their child because, not because it's wrong, but if my child is in this place, they are more likely to find whatever it is that I'm trying to keep them away from. And it's not, it's not always wrong. It's why young people, trust your parents' instincts. Um, you know, don't get stupid and say, well, I can't do anything. We dealt with that last week. The devil's the one who tried to get Eve to say you can't do anything. You know, because the devil said, if you were here, uh, did God say you can't eat of any of these trees? That's the devil. No, she can eat from all the trees, except for one. So don't word it that way. And if some young person says, my parents won't let me do anything. Oh, yeah, you can work. You can mow the lawn. You can clean the garage. You can blow the cobwebs off. You can, you can do a lot of things. You can breathe. Uh, you make your bed. Um, but so he says, neither give place to the devil. So here's the thing. I don't want to set up at my table a spot where he's comfortable. I want to make it awkward for the devil to get to me. And so with that, um, I was talking to a young couple recently and, um, and they got rid of all their TV and, you know, all the different, you know, you don't, we don't have a TV. Yeah. But you watch the games on your phone and you watch Netflix on your tablet and you watch Hulu on your computer. You've got three TVs and they're in your pocket. <laughs> But, uh, but I'll tell you, the best thing that I think started our marriage out was no TV and no phones and no nothing. I mean, we didn't have anything. And uh, we went for, through college with no TV in the early years of our church with no TV. And then when we got rich, we had a, a VCR and a TV, but we weren't hooked to anything. And so we had a little more control. And then we got real worldly. And uh, we actually have TV. It's TV now. But... I can't run it. If I want to turn it off to ask my wife, can you turn it on? But, um, but the, the thing is, look at the stuff that's going to get into your kid's life. And don't leave any place available. Now, if they want to go find stupid all on their own, that's their fault. But uh, among us, there are things that, that we as the people of God, should not make it easy access to, to evil. And, and every, all, some of us are, have different issues that we ought to be more concerned about than others. Um, I, I don't, I've never had a liquor problem, a drug problem. I've never had those kind of a things. So I could probably go some places that you might not, might, maybe you should not go. And I try to keep my standards so I'm not going to lead anyone else to stumble. But that's another principle. So first of all, neither give place to the devil. Be very much on guard what you allow to, to have in your world. And again, um, this, this crazy world, you know what's funny? Not funny, it's terribly sad to me, tragically sad. We've got a world where preschoolers know how to use phones and tablets and they've never yet read a word in the Bible. And you know it. There are kids two and three years old that can get a phone on and operating. But they've never read a Bible. And already their mind is being corrupted by the junk in this world. 
uh, besides the fact that screen, that much screen is not good, but anyway. Um, so first of all tonight, first word is place. Let's don't give the devil what? Don't give him a place. Don't, don't make it easy for him. We have handicapped parking places, and they're a little wider, and there's ramps. And you can trip over those ramps just like you can over a curb. But, uh, but what are we trying to do? We're giving them a place. We have senior citizen parking around here. I parked in one of them tonight. And, uh, and uh, they're, we're, we're trying to give a place that's easier. And uh, back here, we did have signs. I don't know if they're still there. That was seniors or nursery. So that mom's carrying. Can you, yeah, you that are older, have you lifted a car seat lately? You know, when, when our kids were little, a car seat was just this little flimsy. It was nothing. Now car seats weigh about 50 pounds. And then you put a, a Kenny in, like Kenny's 30 pounds already. You got 80 pounds. And the moms are holding it. You can tell which arm the mom carries the kid in because it's like this. But, but, so we give a place for the nursery moms and seniors and all that. Now look over to 2 Corinthians. Remember, we're going to come back to Ephesians. But go back a little bit before uh, Ephesians and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians, and all, I think all these verses tonight will be verses you're familiar with, but I don't know if you've ever put them together at the same time to see the relationship between Satan and you. I remember Satan was the anointed cherub. He was the one that covered the throne of God or covered the mercy seat. He was, remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about him being on the, the stones of fire. And we read in Ezekiel and uh, some things about that. He was cast down, cast out of heaven, um, and, and he's been causing havoc ever since. But look at 2 Corinthians 12. Now, this is about the Apostle Paul and the glory in his life of uh, such amazing things he saw and did. Look at verse 5, 2 Corinthians 12, 5. Of such a one I will glory, will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seemeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And uh, we're going to have a series, a little bit of a time on pride in a bit, but don't get telling people how good a job you're doing. You know, Proverbs says, let, let another man praise thee, and not thine own lips. Um, if, if you're telling people how good a job you've done, you are failing. The very fact that you would say that is an admission of failure right there um, because we're just not that good all right but anyway uh, it was the devil who said I'll do this and I'll do this and anyway so uh, but, but look at verse 7 2nd Corinthians 12 7 lest I should be exalted above measure there's a reason this all happened Paul had raised the dead he'd seen heaven he'd he'd written is in the process of writing the scripture all these things and unless he should be exalted, here's what happened. Through the abundance of the revelations, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. Look at this now, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And so the apostle Paul, because of his very unique gifts, because of the things that he'd seen and done and been a part of, it would have been real easy for him to be lifted up in his own eyes and to be very proud and, and to stumble because pride goeth before a fall. And so, um, and you'll see that when we get over to Timothy in a few minutes. Um, and so Paul, because of all these amazing things, what did God do? God allowed Satan to send a messenger. So here, here's the, the, uh, the devil, and he, he says to, uh, uh, you know, little devil over there, you go cause Paul all kinds of trouble. And God let it happen. The messenger of Satan was sent, and what's the word? The messenger of Satan was sent to do what? To buffet. Now that's not like golden corral. That's a buffet. A buffet, to beat him, to, to cause him trouble, to just to just harass him and cause him trouble. And some people say it was eyes, some, you know, it was a physical infirmary, most everybody agrees. Um, you know, it could have been any number of things. God doesn't name it. There are things that would indicate, but whether it was arthritis or, or, or you know, whatever, uh, whatever physical malady he had, it was the messenger of Satan was sent to 
buffet Paul so that he would not be exalted above measure. Just a, 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 I don't know, a discouraging thought. If you're unusually blessed, if you are unusually good at something, you can expect to be beat up more than others. Because the devil always shoots at the one who's going to accomplish the most. Uh, they shoot at the general. They shoot at the president. They shoot at, remember, the stories of George Washington, how he came back from battle, had three horses shot up from underneath him. He took his coat off. There were five or six bullet holes in his coat, and, uh, and he remained unscathed. Well, it's because God had his hand in that thing. But there are people, um, of course, you want to take down the leader. You want to take down the strength. And, if, and, and that's why we should be so much on guard. And you young men, that, that maybe you excel at athletics, be very careful to remember there's a God who gave you those hands and gave you those eyes and gave you the, the coordination. If you're good at music and whatever it might be, understand there is going to be some buffeting that is, it is going to come. It will come. Because it'll, otherwise you're going to get proud. And if you get proud, then God can't use you anymore. So, so Paul says, much. look at that next verse. Paul says in, in uh, verse 8, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that he would, uh, do, would depart from me. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee. And God said, I I'll give you grace to handle it. And then Paul says, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that buffeting, that the power of Christ may rest in me. So Paul said, I've got a choice of God leaving, uh, keeping the devil from buffeting me, and then I'm going to get proud and lose God's blessing. Or I can have the devil's minions beating me and find God's blessing and wealth and glory. And Paul said, I'd rather get beat up and be blessed than not get beat up and, and not be blessed. And, and I would rather be in the middle. I'd rather not be beat up and be blessed. But that's not an option in this story. And so uh, just, you know, sometimes you might think, I've been trying and trying and I've worked hard and I've tried to do the right thing. And I'm, yeah, you can expect to get shot at. It's just assumed um, because those kind of things happen. And uh, so, number one, we don't want to give, what is it? We don't want to give place to the devil. Don't give him any easy inroads. Don't make room for him. Number two, we are likely to be what by the devil? Buffeted, buffeted, all right? Now go over to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, go back towards where we were in Ephesians and a little bit further, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now this is not something Satan would do to you, but it's with the verse we're going to look at and it'll help make sense to you a little bit here. 1 Timothy chapter 3. This chapter is talking about the requirements for a pastor. Paul left uh, Timothy in Ephesus. They'd had lots of people saved. They had uh, churches that are getting established. But they needed leadership, Timothy and Titus, the pastoral epistles, they call them. Um, they talk about how to organize a church, what you need, who could do what and what positions and all these things. And so we're looking here in chapter three about the requirements for a pastor where Paul said to Timothy, if you're going to find someone that you're going to put in the position of a pastor or an elder or a bishop, those are all synonymous. He says there's a list of things. But I want you to notice in verse six, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now that's not talking about the devil comes along and condemns him. That's talking about over in Ezekiel 28, the devil said, or oh, Isaiah 14, I mixed them up. I'll be like the most high. I'll lift my throne above the stars of God and I will be this and I'll be that. And he was exalted through his beauty. He was exalted through his wisdom. And because of his pride, God cast him down and he was condemned because of his pride. And so when Paul said to Timothy, if you're picking a pastor uh, and a novice is in an age, a novice is a spirit and experience. And um, it's the type of person. Uh, there's a lot of things in this, but but he says not a novice lest being lifted up with pride. He fall into the condemnation of the devil. The same reason the devil was condemned. This guy will get condemned. Because he'll be a pastor and he'll be thinking he's really somebody and God will have to put him down. And so he needs to be mature enough to handle the responsibilities and the blessings without thinking it's all about him. So this isn't the devil doing anything to us or us to the devil. 
but it's right in the same context. I want to put it, explain it because look at the next verse now. Look at verse 7. Moreover, he must have a good report of them that are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So another thing the prospective pastor would have to have is he must have a good report of them that are without. So you might, maybe everybody in the church thinks well of this guy, but how does the person he rents his house from, what does he think of him? How about the mechanic who did the work on his car? What does he think of him? Those people who are not in church, those people who are not a part of the body of Christ, how do those people who are without, what, does he have a good report out there? Because Paul said, if he doesn't have a good report out there, the devil's going to set a snare. You know how snares are? You've all gone out and snared rabbits and things, of course, you've done that. Do you, anybody know what a rabbit is? <laughs> but anyhow, a snare, you know, you, you set a little a circle string and come over here and tie it to something, maybe a bent over branch or whatever, and they trip it and it snags, and it, it'll, it, a snare will just grab a foot and a trap might break their neck, their back, whatever. I know it's very inhumane, but it's also a lot of fun. But anyhow, um, the humane ways to catch rats. Sledgehammer? <laughs> This world is so, this world lives worshiping and serving the creature more than the creator. What a crazy world you're in. You young people, you're going to have to, you're going to have to have a safe place for ants in your house. <laughs> this corner over here, it's the roach corner. All the roaches are welcome there. We will not put any poison over there. This is the roach safe place. But, but a snare. And so a snare will grab that foot. And, and then if you get a hold of the string, the rope, whatever, you can pick it up. You can drag them around. You can swing them around, whatever you want to do. Pick them up and kill them and skin them and sell the skin, whatever. So uh, that's a snare. And so he says, um, moreover, he must have a good report of them that are without, lest he fall into the condemnation. I'm looking at this. Um, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So you're out there in this world and you have a bad testimony in these places. The devil starts setting snares. And it gives him an opportunity to snare you or to, to get a hold of, of this person. And he's talking about the, the potential leader in the church. And, of course, the devil would love to, to get the leader. And so uh, it's very, Paul said to Timothy, find out what his, his reputation is outside. Because it's hard enough to go on for God without without having more snares set for you. Now turn over a couple of pages to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're looking at snaring again. Now 2 Tim, or 1 Timothy 3, that is a practical snare. He's talking about bills being paid, kept your word. There's a couple of years ago they were talking to me, and I don't know what, what brought it up, but he said, yeah, we just got a new rental here, and... Uh, took a while to get all the utilities we had to put them in my wife's name because where we lived before with the utilities were in my name and we didn't pay all the we didn't pay the utilities so they won't put them in my name so we had to put them in my wife's name I thought why did you tell me that <laughs> you know pay your bills okay come on and um and so but this this the snare of the devil moreover he must have a good report of them that are without lest he he, he fall to reproach it's a reproachful thing and so it's a snare but now we're looking at another snare. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. And let me get over to, to um, verse 23 and follow through here. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid. Uh, he's talking about leadership here and not just the pastor, I don't think. But verse 24, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If peradventure, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Now he's talking about theological things. He's talking about Bible doctrine, second coming of Christ, deity of Christ, heaven, hell, salvation by grace. And he says, that he says, if you're picking somebody to be a teacher or leader, he needs to be gentle. He needs to be able to teach. He needs to be able to open the word of God up and explain to people the doctrines in the word of God. If peradventure. You know, there's a lot of people, you could show them all the Bible in the world, they're not changing. They're so set. But he said, you don't want to fight over these things. And so that's why he says in uh, verse 24, don't strive, don't get enough fuss about it, but, but try to teach. 
And, and notice in verse 25, he says that God will peradventure will give them repentance. You know, you think about repentance, you need to repent of your drugs, your liquor, your gambling, your hatefulness, whatever. Do you know God wants people to repent of their wrong doctrine? That's the Bible there. You see, you might have, a, maybe you steal or whatever, and you know, you steal cars, and as long as you tithe 20% on stolen items, so not really, you, um, you've got whatever sinful deed that you do. For the most part, those things are personal. But doctrine messes with God's house. And any, any sin that gets, gets messing with the church is, is, is worse because it affects so many people. Uh, that's why in my home, uh, I have a family. And I'm responsible my, for my behavior because the dominoes fall to mom and sister and wife and kids and grandkids. And, and so my behavior does matter in those things. And theologically it does. And so he says, this is a vital thing. So look now at verse 26. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. There are theological snares. And I'll finish that. Don't lose your place. So the devil comes along and he throws a theological snare. You're watching YouTube and you're just, you know, you're just looking, oh, this looks interesting. Let's read about this. Let's listen to this guy talk about that. And pretty soon you're wondering whether people are predestined to heaven and hell and you're wondering whether the Jews are really the chosen people of God and you're wondering is there really a rapture and you know you're you're being you're you're being influenced and there are snares set out there when I was first in Bible college the snares were either in the pulpit on the radio or books and who has money for books when you're in Bible college but now now the snares are here. Everybody's phone, YouTube, and, and uh, Rumble, and, and uh, all these other places. And there's, there's cyber snares, theological snares set out there. And so if you hear me talking about something theologically or an issue, there's a need for it. We need to keep our doctrine right. And you need to be able to, to spot those theological snares to keep you from messing things up. And it's not an easy world to be in theologically because you're being bombarded by so much garbage. But you'll notice the last phrase. Who are taken, we're in verse 26, who are taken captive by him at his will. You see, once the snare catches a leg, that person or animal, that animal snared has no control anymore. They're taken. And we need to be careful. Have you ever met someone and they've got a, a doctrinal, maybe, they, maybe you grew up together and they made a step here doctrinally and you made a, you made a step there and, and you know, just a little bit different. But you come back some years later and you think, man, how did they get way over here? How did they get there? Stupid doctrinal dumb. They've gone way over the theological cliff. You know why they did that? They're taken captive by him at his will. Once they get snared, that's why, you know, you'll see me stubbornly clinging to what I've been taught and what the word of God teaches. And I won't bend because I, ca I cannot afford to step into a snare and nor can you for that matter. So, number one, we said uh, you should not give what? Don't give place to the devil and then understand that there may be times for our own benefit. The devil will buffet us. And then third, we can be snared. All right. We can be what snared in our in our literal physical life or in our theological life. All right. Let's go on. We got several to go to here and uh, we got to get to the point of the message. Go to first Thessalonians. Go back a couple of pages, just two or three pages before Timothy is first and second Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter two. You want to know some of those snares? It's a teacher at college. It's a guy or a girl. Uh, I'm thinking now of a, of a man never went to church, never. No, had no need, no use for God or church until he met a girl who went to church. 
and he went to church with her until he got married to her, and they never went back again. And soon, neither did she. He was the snare. Or he was the bait. And you get off from here, and you go to college and, and meet people, you make sure that they've got the same faith you have. Amos 3.3 says, can two walk together except they be agreed? You've got to believe the same. And, you know, we, I remember growing up not having any real religion. But you hear about people, well, you know, a Lutheran doesn't want their family member to marry a Jew or a Baptist. Or, and, you, and, and when you don't have any faith, you think, well, what difference does it make? But once you're saved, you realize it makes a big difference. You're talking about picking the person who's going to be your child's parent. You know, you ladies, you're going to be saying to your children do what your daddy says or do what your mother says and you better pick them very carefully and uh, because you will you will really regret getting snared in the practical sense or in the theological sense and again if you hear me uh, fussing on things, usually there's pretty good reason for it. First Thessalonians chapter 2. The this church at Thessalonica, Paul started, um, if people's research is right, he was only there a few months. An amazing church started. He went on his way, left a phenomenal church. He's writing this letter back to that church. And look at uh, the end of chapter 2 and look at verse 17. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire he missed him this is up this was there was some warmth and sweetness in this relationship between paul and this church verse 18 wherefore when we would have come to you even i paul once and again but satan did what hindered that's our next word satan hindered us now i'm just going to throw out a guess that paul the apostle is probably a better christian than most of us and yet Satan hindered him. Now, one of the things the devil will do is he'll just... Now, hinder doesn't mean stop. Hinder doesn't mean destroy. Hinder doesn't mean make you a, you know, a, a fire-breathing, you know, vomit 20 feet, crazy head spinning around in circle, demon possessed crazy. That's later. Not really. This, that's Hollywood. Hindered is you're all ready for church and the baby throws up on you. And so you change all your clothes, and then the other kid's sitting on the couch with a fever. And you're hindered. It's, you get out to the car, you're on your way to work, and there's a flat tire. It's a stupid flat tire. A smart flat tire would happen on a day you're not going to work. It's, uh, you tie, try your shoes, and the shoelace breaks, and... And you try and figure out what that is. Then a button comes off your shirt when you're buttoning it. And then you can't find the car keys. And, and uh, I pulled up into our house one day when Josiah and Ruth they were with us. They're probably watching this. Uh, they, they watch a lot of the services. It's so funny. I pull up and there's no one out there. And the lights on their car are flashing and then flashing. And uh, just parting. This, I'm looking around. I don't see anybody anywhere. And well, I just ignored it. Went inside. And I say, you know that. I don't know if I said anything right away. And then I see Mary Ann, she's 10 months old, walking around chewing on the remote. <laughs> Flashing lights, locking, unlocking. <laughs> and, uh, and so Satan hindering you is where'd the kid leave the remote, you know, or whatever. And you get up Sunday morning and try and go to church and and you can't find matching shoes for the kids or matching socks for the husband or whatever it might be. It, those are hindrances. Those are things that frustrate you. And uh, you're trying to get the thing done. And, and see, Satan, Satan will just throw junk in your way as a hindrance. So we started out. Number one, don't give place to the devil. Number two, because of pride, sometimes God will allow Satan's messenger to buffet us and that's not a fun thing but it's better than God not using us and then sometimes the devil sets snares and he'll snare us practically or theologically and next Satan will come along and he'll hinder us just hinder us go to Acts chapter 10 Acts chapter 10 and we're going to hurry just a little bit here because a couple of these are uh, need, a, need a couple of minutes Acts chapter 10 very familiar in the house of Cornelius 
Remember, Philip was down in Joppa, or Philip, Peter was down in Joppa praying. He sees this vision. Basically, he says to Philip, it's okay for you to talk to Gentiles up in the city of Caesarea where Cornelius is, a centurion, a Gentile. And the Jews and Gentiles aren't supposed to get together, but God was fixing that, uh, explaining they could. Peter comes into the home, and he begins to, to tell the gospel to the people there in, um, in Cornelius' house. And look at Acts chapter 10. And let's go to verse 38, or verse 37. The word I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea, and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, verse 38 of Acts 10, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were what? Oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Oppressed. Now, you could be really strict in getting definitions, and, and we may vary a little bit, but I'm going to give you some just generic, simple things. Oppressed is, have you, have you ever been in that situation where there's really nothing wrong, you're just in a bad mood? Now, I know you girls do that regular, but I mean normal people. Um, you get the family in the car, and there's just a spirit. I remember Josh and... Hannah, Esther, I don't know which one of our kids, two or three of the kids in the car with me, I was driving on the freeway. And there was a spirit in that car. Now, don't, don't think I'm getting spooky. I'm being realistic here. I pulled the car over. I opened the door and said, get out! And I didn't mean the kids. We're not having that spirit in this car. Of course, the kids thought, Dad's really freaking out. And they were little. I'm talking about little kids. The, the, there is oppression, and you, if you think about it, you've seen it. You know, you, there's just these things that come, and it's like a spirit. You know the word depress or oppress or these, these things. That, it's a pressure on you, and it's this, this gloom that hangs over. And, and so, you know, you just, you just walk through life thinking, oh, I wonder what that is. You know why you've heard me say sing? The devil doesn't like singing. Quoting scripture out loud. You're laying in bed worrying. Quote scripture. Spend time just praising God. Just go through the alphabet and think of something to praise God that has, starts with an A. Apples. B. Bananas. C. Craters. Do whatever you got to do. Um, just talk about how good God is. And you know what's going to happen? The spirit that is oppressing is going to go away. Count your many blessings, name them one by one. You know what's going to happen? You start counting your blessings and having a spirit of thanksgiving, a spirit of gratitude, and the spirit of oppression is pushed away. That's why you need to control your kid's face. St when I, we weren't even in a Christian home and my parents wouldn't let us stomp our feet. You walk away from our parents when they said something, did something, stomp your feet. There was more than that hitting the floor. And that was, I know that was horrible in those days. No one turned out good in those days at all. We didn't need blankets or safe spaces or nothing. We drank water out of a hose. <laughs> didn't need bicycle helmets. And we didn't use sugarless gum. And that's why all of our teeth are <laughs> rotten today. <laughs> so Jesus went about healing all that were what? oppressed there is this oppression going on and young people let me tell you some some of you that that are down a lot sing more quote more scripture and turn off the gloom and doom of this world because it invites oppression i can't spend any more time on it but but i want to encourage you don't don't allow a you that are my age remember the songs rainy days and mondays always get me down or Elton John, think I'm going to kill myself, cause a little suicide. That was, that was mainstream music. It was gloomy and broken heart. And then the country and western, you know, my dog got run over. My cat did too. You know, my girlfriend left with my best friend. And it's, it's a lot of woe is me. And you, you've got to see you, you, that's, that, all that oppression comes along and so satan will oppress us satan will hinder us 
Satan will snare us, Satan will buffet us, and we are not to give him place. Go back over to the book of Jude. If you're in, in Acts, hold on to Acts. We're going to see it in a minute. There's a reason for this order. We're going to come back to Acts in a minute. Look at Jude, right before the book of Revelation. Re uh, Jude chapter 1, because there's only one chapter. First, second, and third John, then Jude. Now, when we talk about you know as well as I do, most of the biggest battles you face are above your shoulders. Like Mike Johnson says, you're crippled too high for crutches. <laughs> we, uh, in, in Hebrews chapter, you're looking for Jude, um, Hebrews talks about being weary and fainting in your mind. And this, this, there's, there's a spiritual battle that goes on. Um, why, why is it you get discouraged, you know, when you're going to read your Bible or fast or, you know, you could, you know, it's funny is how easy it is to fast when you have to do blood work, but try fasting just for Jesus. Because there's a demonic work going on, oppressing. All right, in Jude, look at Jude, look down to verse 9. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a riling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Even Michael, the archangel, was not going to get in a fuss with the devil. What they were fighting over, they're fighting over um, Moses' body. And, um, and, and Michael was not going to get into a contention. But I want you to notice Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil. Do you know one of the things the devil will do is bring in contention? He'll bring in contention. I marvel when people tell me, you know, I was on the phone. I don't know what to do. My friend, relative, whoever, they just cuss me and yell at me. And, and Why don't you hang up? Well, I don't want to be mean. You don't have, nobody's got a right to cuss you. You know, I tell our secretaries, anybody's ugly on the phone, hang up. And then expect them to call immediately back. So be ready to hang up immediately and then just don't answer the phone. Who cares? No one has that right. But see, contention is a satanic thing. You, you know, you, you, you ladies, maybe you're men, you've done it. You thought, oh, I want to just really have a nice night or afternoon or day, whatever, for my wife or my husband. And so you got everything all set up. And then they come in an hour late and, and they've had everything go wrong that could go wrong. And they've got a bad attitude. They don't even want to see you. There's a spirit of contention. There's a spirit in a church. Um, I, I will not, I will not allow a spirit of contention in our church. It's been rare that I've had to deal with it, but I, but I won't. And some of you were in a meeting a few years ago when I, I just said, you know what, I think we need to dismiss the meeting. And someone said, I don't think we're ready. And I said, anybody ready? Are you guys ready to dismiss the meeting? Like 99% of the people raised their hand. I said, good, we're done, prayed and left. You know why? I will not stay because Satan brings contention. And he may be intellectual, and he may be articulate, but, but those are things we can't have. Um, you, you just, you've got to guard it in your home, and don't let your children do it. Don't let your children cultivate a spirit of contention between them. And you've got to create an atmosphere where people want peace. Blessed, Jesus said, of the peacemakers. And that ought to be our place. And Satan will bring contention. He will work at bringing contention. All right. So uh, number one, we said, let's go back. I want you to remember these. Number one, you are not to give place to the devil. And sometimes you will be buffeted and it ain't no fun. Uh, Satan has set snares for you, theological or practical. And then Satan sometimes will try to hinder. That's how you're remembering a lot. Hinder you. Just cause you to stumble and trip up things. Just try to get to the doctor. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm 65. I know you don't believe I could even possibly be that old. But I, I need to go to the dentist. And so um, everything's changed since I turned 65. And so I called our dentist up. Oh, Mr. Goddard, yeah, yeah, we got time. Here's a date. And I, she said, let's just check your record, make sure things are okay. And when I told her I've gone to Medicare or whatever the dental coverage is, she says, we don't handle that. And she hung up on me. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I mean, didn't, not hateful, just said, sorry, we don't cover it. And I, I thought, oh, all right, well, I don't like you either. And the contention devil came along. <laughs> 
There's a hindrance. It's not the end of the world, just frustrating and hindrance and these things getting in your way. And then you can be oppressed. That's the spirit. And then there's a contentious spirit that comes. Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Let me just show you this and then one more. Acts chapter 5. Most of you know the story. Brand new, passionate, growing church. Thousands of people being saved. 3,000 on Pentecost. 5,000 a little few days later. People everywhere getting saved. And there's a lot of... of uh, of uh, political pressure and people are losing jobs, properties being taken, the Christians are suffering persecution. And so along comes uh, some Christians and said, you know, we're just gonna sell what we've got. We'll bring the money to the apostles and they'll make sure everybody's got food and especially the widows and make sure they're taken care of. And, and so people were bringing stuff that they're sold and, and uh, there was a great spirit there. So we're in the midst of that. Look at Acts chapter five and verse one. And but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price with his wife also being privy to it. Now, let me ask you, do you think Ananias and Sapphira are saved? Not a trick question. I think so. I don't see any reason to think to doubt that they're saved. Uh, I mean, they may not be, but they're in the church. They're personal friends to these people. They sold their property and, and took the majority or at least a big chunk of the money to bring it to give to the poor. Um, and there may be somebody who knows more Bible than me could show some theological thing that says they aren't. But I don't know any reason to doubt their salvation. But um, they laid it at the end of verse 2 at the apostles' feet. Verse 3, but Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and keep back part of the price of the land? Next thing that can happen, Satan can fill your heart. He can fill your heart. Now, he can't control your behavior. But haven't you had a bunch of stuff dumped in here at some t one time or another? Haven't you been sitting there thinking about th stuff and thinking, man, I can't think that way? Sure we have. Who's putting that stuff in there? The wicked one. But I want you to notice the rebuke. Look at verse 3 again. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart? Who's getting the question? Ananias. He didn't say, Satan, why did you fill Ananias' heart? He said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart? You know what? Satan, Ananias had a part in this thing. Ananias was standing there looking at the model homes, not liking the mobile home he lives in. And he was giving place to the devil. He was sitting there looking at this money he got and tight you know what man that's been our money we sold our house we've saved all these years that's ours we need to give it all we we'll just give a chunk of it i mean giving a chunk's more than most people are giving my we, we're gonna keep and he started thinking what he could buy and he started coveting or he started being jealous or envious i don't know what it was but but it caused him to lie and and satan came along and started filling his mind with all this stuff but but ananias let him you'll see in a minute you can Resist the devil. You can. Don't blame the devil. You did wrong because you chose to do wrong. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, 1 Corinthians says, that God is faithful who will not allow you to suffer to be tempted above that you're able, but will with that temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear. We sin not because we are weak, but because we are wicked. We, we, we stumble into sin because we were looking for it. We usually just jump in like a swimming pool. All this, and again, for all that we understand, don't, don't doubt that Satan can put stuff in your head. Your spouse does this or that, and suddenly you're acting this way, and you're sitting around, oh, man, that old woman of mine, and the devil comes along and says, you're right, you know what, you deserve better than that. He, you've given place to him, and he's filling your uh, your heart getting you to lie and he is probably bringing oppression and contention and hindrances and everything else look over to Ephesians where we started Ephesians chapter 6 Ephesians chapter 6 and you know this verse Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11 put on Ephesians 6 11 put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the what wiles of the devil 
And I am to put on the armor of God so I can stand against the wiles of the devil. So I can stand. And if I don't stand, it's because I was not prepared. Because I didn't have my armor on. If you want to write in the margin of your Bible, we won't turn there for the sake of time. Write James chapter 4, verse 7, next to that verse. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. And so you're sitting there, and uh, this covetous thought, Hey, I can take that thing, and my boss won't even know about it. And, I just, and you say, No, I'm not going to think that way. You cast down those thoughts. Uh, you get thinking that you've got a better idea, uh, you've got a plan. I know, God, I know God said, don't eat the fruit, but you know what? It's a tree to be desired to make one wise. You cast those thoughts down. And you don't let them fill your heart. You don't let him get in there. So in Ephesians 6, 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He will try to fill our heart. He'll try to con bring contention into your home, your job, your athletic. Show me, a, show me a sports team fighting with each other. They're in big trouble. Big trouble. Um, the, the devil will come along and cause a spirit of oppression. He'll come and bring a hindrance. Just those little things you're stumbling over. He'll, he'll bring snares. He'll buffet us. Uh, and that's in the will of God uh, for our own good. And our job, number one, is to not give place. And the last one, our job, is to resist. Resist the devil and he will flee. You are not a worthless pawn walking through this world that has no control. You're, you're a child of the creator, a child of God. Um, but there are some ground rules. And you can't violate those. Um, otherwise, you open doors to these unclean spirits. All right, let's pray. Father, help us to be vigilant, sober, knowing we have an adversary. May we not be so casual that we forget that even in a comfortable world like where we live, there is an enemy, and he is seeking whom he may devour. And uh, when those, that spirit of oppression comes, may we resist it. When the contention comes, may we determine to cast it down. And Lord, we just ask for help. Thank you for the blessings in our church. And thank you for the wonderful families here. And all these, uh, these families put together the sweetness and the living for others and the generosity and all that goes on to make this church what it is. Bless your people. Protect them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you. Have a great night. Don't forget. So